I had to figure it out. At first, it was amusing to watch. Then it became puzzling, and then aggravating. Every day, I'd watch my coworker take a sip from his coffee mug. Same ivory, obviously handcrafted coffee mug. He'd take a sizable sip, grimace for at least three or four seconds, and then take another sip after his face had relaxed. He'd repeat this behavior two or three times, then set the mug down and resume his work. Later, perhaps an hour or two, he'd conduct the little ritual again, the intensity of the grimace never intensifying, but not waning either. Like anyone else, my initial thought was that he had simply added a hefty dose of alcohol to the cup and was grimacing at the strength of the booze, or the overall taste of the concoction. And like someone who knows how to mind their own business, I never asked him, never confronted this person who might genuinely need a little extra in his cup to get through the mind-breaking monotony of our job. But I'm still a curious person. Couldn't simply let this assumption ride completely unconfirmed, especially not since he'd do this every single day. I'd never personally known an alcoholic, but his productivity and the quality of his work were not reflective of someone who was always on the edge of a buzz, clinging less and less to sobriety. No offense to alcoholics. I'm sure there are some efficient, perfectly functional ones. So I hoped. I started to walk by his desk right after he'd taken a sip. But never once did I smell even the faintest scent of booze. Coffee, sure. Sometimes stale and slightly acrid, like burnt sweetener. But never the distinctly pungent scent of alcohol. As far as I was concerned, the man was clean. Something else about the coffee was making him physically wince and go misty-eyed with every sip. And I was determined to find out what. There's no coffee maker in our office. The company could easily afford to give us each our own... Our manager has a very flashy, assuredly expensive one in his office, but they've never supplied the employees with one in our break room. And while I can't speak for everyone, I've decided to never shell out the 20 or so bucks to buy a cheap coffee maker to save everyone the trouble. Because I know that's exactly what the company wants us to do. And I'm too much of a spiteful, petty person to let them win this virtually non-existent squabble. So I make my coffee at home. The point behind all this is that one day, I thought of a plan to find out once and for all what the hell was in my coworker's cringe-inducing coffee. Leaving my coffee mug in the car after having gulped down the throat-searing brew, of course, I came into work and said aloud, very close to him, damn it, forget my coffee. He had just been in the process of taking a sip from his mug, presumably the first of the day. My little practiced outburst stopped him, and before his lips could touch the cup, I followed my little performance up with... Would you mind if I had a tiny sip of yours just, you know, start the day? I motioned towards the water cooler, on which sat little plastic cups, showing that I wouldn't even have to infringe upon the surface area of his cup with my stranger lips. He stared at me for a moment, inscrutably and silently, and then looked to his cup, intently, as if staring into a depth far greater than that of a 16-ounce container. Finally, after what had been six seconds of weird uncomfortable silence, he nodded, almost solemnly, as a priest might upon pondering the legitimacy of a frequent sinner's claim to contrition. Barely containing my morbid excitement, I went and retrieved one of the plastic cups and set it before him. As if pouring a sacramental drop to further the Catholic analogy, there was a genuine air of reverence in how he gently tipped his mug towards the cup to let the black steaming liquid stream out. Once done, he returned the lid to his mug and slid the plastic cup back to me. I took it, thanked him profusely and sincerely, my curiosity had reached its boiling point, and returned to my desk. I didn't look back at him upon arriving, but I knew that he was watching me, as casually as I could manage, given my palpable excitement. I brought the cup to my lips and took a small sip. The experience was unlike anything I could have ever imagined. And upon regaining my composure, I found myself shocked, profoundly amazed, at how my coworker had so routinely imbibed the liquid, with only a grimace or a shudder afterwards. The base fundamental element was coffee, you yeah? know, a dark roast without sugar or cream, brewed strongly. But the drink's overall potency, its primal effect, was owed not to the caffeine, but to the other element, 
the thing with which the drink had been spiked. I wasn't immediately made aware of this singular ingredient, and at the moment I could only guess with hilarious inaccuracy as to its nature, but I knew, before being told later, that it wasn't something you'd find in any store, and neither was it procurable through any legal means or channels. And as my co-worker had done so many times before, I recoiled from it, as if I had instead sipped boiling poison. Its basic taste not necessarily acrid, but more so slimy, ill-textured, offensive to the palate in many ways, none of which I can sufficiently describe. But what I can describe, what I can strangely give a clear account of, is the resultant feeling, the physical discomfort and mental disclarity of its consumption. The immediate sensation elicited was of mental displacement. Swallowing the substance brought an abrupt shift in my senses of equilibrium, not dissimilar to missing a step when descending a staircase. That brief panic-inducing sense of weightlessness wherein you feel as if you've been betrayed by either the architecture of the building or gravity itself. Following on the heels of this was a mounting sense of dread, seemingly sourceless, though nonetheless powerful and nerve-firing. I felt the ominous cataclysm of growing approach of something, the imminent arrival of a thing or entity whose sole and dark-hearted purpose was the end of all terrestrial life, and not just on Earth, but on every biologically inhabited sphere in the cosmos. This dread and cosmic anxiety soon gave way to a pitch-black, soul-dampening despair, so I became assured that nothing, no power on Earth, would be able to stop the arrival of this ultra-mundane presence. In a deeply worrying cardiac event, my heart rate climaxed and then reversed to a glacial, murmurous slowness. I suddenly felt wrapped up in an invisible, languor-inducing web to await the predatory encroachment of this unhuman waver. My mind was then filled with visions, fleeting, nebulous and largely indescribable in their imagery, but carrying the same import of unavoidable doom. Flashes of lightless gulfs, endless imploding voids, vast basins filled with volcanic shadows. Titanic shards of obliterated worlds floating listlessly in the black vacuity of outer space, all omening some ultimate undoing of life. And through it all, present amidst every abyssal vista, ubiquitous amongst the horrific scenery, was a figure, sometimes appearing as a solid, tangible thing, and other times as a warped, amorphous fragment of some ultra-human body, the nightmarish memory of something too horrible to maintain a composite form. And then, just as abruptly as it had come, the feeling left me. The dread and despair and awful, unplaceable sorrow melted away. And I was back at work, sitting calmly, suddenly instilled with a deep sense of clarity, of peacefulness. I looked into the cup and saw my normal face reflected back at me. I was sure I would see a terror-stricken despair befall an expression, but my face was relaxed. My expression, befitting someone who had moments ago been told they would no longer need to worry about some previously confounding problem. My co-worker's hand fell on my shoulder, and looking up at him, I saw the same expression of total serenity. He smiled, and he told me to find him after work. Then he returned to his desk, and we separately attended to our tasks for the day. The day ended, and as he had asked, I found him waiting outside of the entrance of the building. He told me to follow him home, and without asking why, I complied. I knew immediately that there was more of the peculiar coffee, that the sordid, ineffable half-images and suggestions that I had witnessed in my mind had a greater significance. He pulled into his driveway and I parked along the road, not expecting to be there for long. He waited for me to exit my car and then gestured for me to follow him to the garage. First looking around furtively, he motioned for me to stand next to him 
and then typed the door's code into the keypad. The garage began to open, and just when it had risen about chest level, he gripped me by the shoulders, pulled me down, and flung me inside. I barely managed to get my hands up and prevent myself from falling face first onto the dusty concrete. I heard him clamor in behind me, and then the reversal of the garage's motion boomed within the confined space. When it had finally closed, he helped me to my feet and apologized before I could come up with a complaint. It's better to enter from this way, to see it up front for the first time. Without the evening light of outside, the garage was completely dark. My coworker told me to wait a minute while he turned on the light. I expected either the dim, barely luminant glow of a cheap bulb or a harsh, bug-attracting brilliance of a floodlight, but instead... Instead, an eerie crimson light filled the room, casting a sanguine gloom upon everything. The objects immediately near me were ordinary. A rusted mountain bike, a pump for its tires, few unlabeled moving boxes, gardening tools hung on rubber hooks affixed to the left wall, a long metal chest against the right wall, probably containing fishing or hunting equipment. But in stark contrast to these mundane subterranean items was the thing against the far wall of the garage, above which was situated the blood-tinged light. To put it plainly, it was... A head. A massive, extremely rotted head. The sheer enormity of it was what I first noticed. It spanned the entire back wall of the garage, lying on its right cheek facing us. From its intermittently lumpy and cratered scalp to the tunnel-like stub of its neck, with the left temple almost touching the ceiling, its skin, sallow and leprous, was taut against the skull. The physiognomy wholly unidentified. The second thing I noticed and was deeply appalled by was the advanced state of decomposition. But not just that. But it seemed, despite this, to live. Its moldered, rather perpetually moldering skin, the pulses and gangrenous lumps throbbing hideously, undergoing an impossible inflammation. The severity of its sickness, the undeniable certainty of its death, Coupled with these contradictory signs of life, it reminded me of one of the more solid glimpses of that delirium-haunting figure. And I realized that I was looking at the real, physical form of that gulf-traversing emissary. The despair priest, or preacher, whatever you prefer, he appeared in my garage one day while I was watching the old TV. I'd been in a really good mood, just finished watching a live stream of mass from my church back home. Hadn't found a local one yet. Well, I guess my moment of uh, triumphant spirituality caught this thing's attention. It appeared right there, simply manifested as if it had teleported from some other place. Only back then, its face hadn't yet decayed. Still dying. There was more life than death in it. I was, of course, terrified. Yes. Scared out of my fucking mind, and all the joy and love from the Lord bled out of me in an instant. Dread washed over me. The most bizarre thing was how how good it felt. If that makes any sense. It was it was intoxicating. The scale of my hopelessness somehow enthralled me. The way he spoke about the experience was almost nostalgic. I felt my body begin to prepare for some kind of fight or flight state. His face, serene and pallid, looked deathly in the sanguine light, like a corpse reposed in an alcove within a torch-lit tomb. Not knowing how to respond, I just said, Well, shit. He nodded. The sorrowful smile spread across his face, then continued. I sensed that it was dying. Would have known even if I wasn't able to see the thing. I was also somehow made aware of the fact that its purpose was to spread this dread, you know, to fill people with a horrible, terrible despair. Wherever it could find them. The dread priest evangelizing the cosmos with intimations and images of hopeless and nihility. 
But he was dying, couldn't fill this mantle completely. It had been a little healthier, a little less eroded by rot. It would have succeeded in entrapping me. I would have succumbed to an irremediable despair and been left to die, probably. Either through self-neglect, malnutrition, or self-termination. But eventually, I snapped out of it and left the garage. The feeling still lingered. Tiny sorrow-tipped hooks had been embedded in my psyche. Happiness and optimism returned to me eventually. Initially, these feelings were more potent. More potent than they had ever been. I felt exultant in my praise for God, joyous in my existence. These intensities quickly faded, and I was left dejected and glum. I didn't want to admit it at first, but I knew I had to eventually return to it. I'd have to eventually expose myself again to the undying thing so that I could immerse myself in its unwholesome radiation in order to feel the subsequent spiritual ecstasy of its absence. It was a monstrous and darkly fantastic story. I stared at the thing with a new level of disgust. It had come from some far-flung domain of space to spread despair, to bring civilizations to ruin not with some cosmic violence or by annihilation of the dominant species, but through an emission of volatile hopelessness, a pervasive broadcast of mortal futility. Having an idea but not needing to confirm it, I asked an unspeakable, darkly revelatory question. What does this have to do with the coffee? My co-worker pulled his mug from his pocket. I hadn't noticed he'd been carrying it with him. He went over to the ghoulish head. As casually as if it were a drink dispenser, he put the cup under one of the ever-seeping pores until the foul black slime filled it to the brim. Then, without a moment of hesitation, he brought the mug to his lips and took a sip. His revulsion was more powerful than I'd ever seen, and he lingered longer than usual in that state of despondent reflection. But he soon recovered and dumped the rest into the eyeless socket abreast with his shoulder. I only add a little to my morning coffee. If I were to drink a whole cup of this, I'd probably lose myself that awful sorrow. That did not right kill me due to some kind of toxicity at high doses, but yeah, that's it. I add a little to my coffee, suffer through micro doses of despair, and then spend the rest of the day feeling pretty damn good. To take a sip here and there, sure. The periods can vary in length, but I'd say it's far better than just enduring life as it is, you know? Even with religious optimism, life can really fucking suck. Sometimes it's almost intolerably hard to get up and go to work and exist. At least this way I'm chasing a state of harmless optimism and positivity, rather than some ever-dwindling state of normalcy. It even helped me feel closer to God, if you can believe it. Well, I doubted that final part of his claim. I saw the sense in the rest of it. I had felt good after the clearing of the despair, though I was already feeling a little low, a little deprived of my intoxicant-inducing joy. I had so many questions for him, you know, why keep it? Why not show the authorities or scientists or try to destroy it? But as the seconds ticked by and I smelled the weird, not-right scent of its ceaseless decomposition, I knew that I would have refrained from showing anyone else as well. I wanted another taste. I craved the post-trauma clarity. Elation. My co-worker had been granted a warped miracle. And had the same been done for me, I... I wouldn't have told a soul. Sensing my desire, he told me to wait there and then went to the house. A few moments later, he returned bearing two cups of steaming coffee. I keep my coffee maker set to brew up a batch in time for my arrival home. I like to stick to a routine with the stuff. He brought both cups under two separate streams of the sickeningly slushy liquid, only for a moment, and then withdrew them, their surfaces tinged with a deeper darkness than before. Smiling, he extended a cup to me, and I accepted the stingent mix like a dying man accepting his last rites. Together, we drank, despaired, and afterwards, 
danced. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Quick reminder, I am also a narrator over at The Chilling. If you guys like the stories that you're listening to here, then I'm sure you'll like the stories that you can listen to over at Chilling, because they're almost the same thing, I'm still narrating them, but you can select your own background music or background sounds, and you could select a whole mess of other narrators, such as Autumn Ivy, Swamp Dweller, and a bunch of my other friends. If you guys are interested in checking out Chilling App, starting up with a free trial, you can use the link in the description down below, or you can head over to thechillingapp.com and also use those free trials to win prizes from their giveaways. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who is supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months, and things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane, and I mean that with all sincerity, that you guys have helped me immensely. <laughs> so, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster, Pepper Squeezer, Travis, Joseph Calarudo, Who Would It Be, Dante Kincaid, Watts Hound 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff the Killer's Cultist, Love You Eminem, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Ember Cork, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Marius, Captain Scurvy, Escadeen, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sack Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Limchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Shelly J, Bacamel, The Leader Account, Melted Lake, Polly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, 80 Nephew, Theater Chip, Acid System, Mom. Here this lot, Buster's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams.